Example. Just a car. Of course, everybody remembers what we were doing yesterday. What were we doing yesterday? Yeah. Something. We started with moments of inertia and determinants. Now we're doing determinants, right. So here's, here's a determinant. So first column is 2, 2, 3, 5, second column is 1, 0, 1, 2, third column is negative 1, 2, negative 3, 3, fourth column is 1, negative 2, 3, negative 4. And I worked so hard to make that come out that way. So remember this symbol means determinant of the matrix. What, I mean, your task is to evaluate that determinant. So what did we say? So what did we say yesterday? We said, remember that the determinant of a matrix means you do script D of these four vectors, the column vectors. And what did we have yesterday? We said that if you switch two vectors, you change the sign. If you scale or multiply a vector, the scalar multiplies the determinant. If you add a multiple of one vector to another, it doesn't change the determinant. And if you get it to the point where you have the standard basis vectors as your columns, the answer is 1. So is that what we're going to do? That's sort of our goal. Now, if you combine that, so before preliminary observation, you don't have to get it all the way to the diagonal matrix. What, do we, what would happen if you had a matrix that looked like the following? So we only have column operations. So this is going to mess you up for a few days, right? We only know how to do this with columns, and that was true even when we were doing stuff in chapter one. We start, we start by doing using zero 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 d and clearing out whatever the star is and see. Yeah. We can get it to a diagonal. So assuming these aren't zero, yeah. you can do what Lama's saying. Assuming d isn't zero, I can add multiples of this column to these columns and clear out the stars. So note. This equals A, 0, 0, 0, star B, 0, 0, star, star C, 0, 0, 0, 0, D, whenever D isn't 0. And then what do you want to say by induction, as it were? Yeah. You can use, similarly, as long as this isn't 0, you can clear those out. So, equals dot dot dot, you can actually make it be diagonal, can you not? Yes. Whenever B, C, and D are not zero. All right, so I'm going to come back and ask you in a minute what happens if one of them is zero. But now, what's this? If you have a diagonal matrix, how do you see what the determinant is going to be? So it's going to be A, B, C, D times. A times five. Five. All five. Five. It's just going to be A, B, C, D. Yeah. So it's going to be A, B, C, D because you, you can say this vector is A times the vector 1, 0, 0, 0. And that multiplies the determinant by A. You can say this vector is B times the vector 1, 0, 1, 0, 0. And that just multiplies the determinant by B. And similarly. C and D. So you get the product of the diagonals. Do we need to worry about whether A is zero? Or are we just assuming it's not? That would work even if A is zero. Right? If this is zero, you can pull out and say it's zero times one. Oh, okay. Okay. So now, in fact, yeah. If A is zero at the get go, can we just like before we're done? Yeah. That's what we've now observed. Well, in fact, so what happens if D is zero? You can always, then it's, it's zero. Okay. Is it it's zero, it's zero. You don't want to do rows. It's a column. If D is zero, 
If D were zero, you'd have a vector that's a zero. And didn't Jonathan or somebody comment yesterday if one of the vectors is zero, the determinant zero automatically? It makes sense because it's a scalar. So when it, recall, if sum vi is the zero vector, script D of the n vectors is automatically zero. So what's the what's this clever proof of that from the properties? Let me just say that zero is multiplied by some column. And can you, can you yeah, vi is just is a just zero times zero any times vector. Some vector. Any so vector. that's a scalar. Yeah, you can multiply Sorry. it by. Yeah. Well, because vi is a that's not the one we say yesterday. Factor what did we say yesterday? We said um, that it's not. Hold on. Has to do with the negative scalars. The negative determinant would have to be the determinant. I can't remember exactly. That was when we talked about switching two of them. We could do negative if two of them were the same. Yeah, right. But well, you could add one of you could if you get a zero vector, you could add one vector to that, and that would change it, and then you have two which are. Or you can multiply. No, it's, you can multiply it by c with negative one. Is just bring it out. Zero vector is zero times one of the standard basis vectors. <coughs> Okay, but then you don't know which basis vector would necessarily have made that be non-zero. Or you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Or you can just say it's negative. You would just know it's. Oh, you would just know it's. Oh. You just add All you do one. is pull out the zero. Yeah. Okay. Just pull out the zero for yeah. Whatever. Well, okay. I actually like Gabe's suggestion better. If you, zero is the unique vector that is not changed by multiplying by any scalar. So for any c not equal to zero, D of CVI, right? This is supposed to be C times the original one. Why is C not equal to zero? Because I said it was. I said C isn't zero. For any C not zero, this is true. But this is the same as vi, because multiplying zero vector by any scalar, it's still zero. So what number is equal to c times itself for any c other than zero? Zero. Zero. <coughs> OK. So if I get a column of zeros, the determinant is zero. Similarly, so that takes care of d is zero. This formula is still holding. And if, if, if D weren't zero and C were zero, then, then you'd still have a column of zeros once you cleared out here. So if any of them is zero, it's zero, it's determined zero. Sorry, can we take one step back to the preliminary observation and just quick, what property did we use to get to that first step for zero, zero? We used the modification. So I, at the end of class yesterday, I said using the properties, we can prove that adding a multiple of one row to another, uh, one column to another, adding a multiple of vi to dj did not change the determinant. Yeah. So we just used multiples of this column to uh, clear out those. So even if it was a um, non-integer multiple? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any real multiple. <coughs> Integers are totally irrelevant. Yes. Okay. So we'll just see our usual method of doing column operations to figure so, this out. Hopefully, by the end of today, we will be relieved of the obligation to do only column operations and know that we can do row operations just as well. But the way we've started out is we're working with columns because we're putting the columns into the matrix. So we have to do everything we were doing before with row operations, we have to think about column operations. And I'm going to do more with that in a minute. All right, so your goal, based on this observation, is to make this thing become Lower triangular or upper would be just as good. But lower triangular is going to be somewhat analogous to what we did with echelon form. And then you just multiply the diagonals once you're lower triangular. All right, so what do you want to do with this matrix? So, example, continue. Yeah, the third to the fourth. So I would encourage you to try to play the same game as we played with 
when we were doing row operations and trying to get to echelon form, try to think about doing pivots in order. So I would prefer to use the first column to clear out all the things across, just like we did. But then that too is a pain in the butt. So what could I do? Switch two columns. Switch two columns, right? And then have a one there, and we can do what the same game we did last semester. So that determinant is going to be the negative if I switch. Okay. John, is it important? Can we switch one, like the first and second column, and the third and fourth column? So that we'll have the next switch. Don't confuse me. <laughs> <laughs> So I've, I've switched one and two, that gives me a negative. And I'm negative one, two, negative three, three. And then one, the last column I remember, three, number four. All right, now, so following the same patterns we did last semester, I want to think about using this pivot and using column operations. So instead of clearing below, I'll clear to the right. So the first column stays the same. What does the second column become? Zero, two, one, one. What does the third column become? Zero, two, negative two, five. What does the third column become? Zero, negative two, negative two, and then negative six. Okay, what do you want to do now? So these are all twos, basically, so I don't need to yeah. be obsessed with getting a one. Agreed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Since these are all twos. So I can do the same game and use this two here to clear out to the right. Agreed? So what's the next column? Zero, negative three, four, negative three, four, four, and then zero, zero, negative five, 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 negative Fractions because these both came out of threes basically. So I do one more step maybe. Yes, yeah, so the last one zero, negative one. one junk. Zero zero zero. <coughs> Two junk. Zero zero. Negative three. Four. And then what's the last column? Zero, zero negative zero, one. Zero. Shouldn't that negative, negative five be a negative two? Say again? Shouldn't that negative 5 in the lower right hand corner be a negative 2? I just listened to what you guys told me. What do I know? Why? 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 I added this column to this column. Okay. All right. I thought you added the third to the fourth. No, we always use the pivot, remember? Okay. So where are we? We finally got upper triangle, lower triangular. And so from our preliminary observation, what's the determinant going to be? Negative 6. We got it. Product here is six, and then we have a negative there, so the answer is negative six. Okay? Yeah, I could I definitely could eyeball that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For those of you who remember, ha ha ha, how to compute three by threes that we did in chapter one. Remember we did this guy times this determinant. Minus this guy times this determinant. Like this is still faster. This does not, that way we did it in, for three by threes does not work. Don't try to do it. Oh, yeah. Well, that way will work if you do it right. You have to do it. But if you do the, if you do the trick that we had of, of copying the first two columns and doing this, that does not work. For higher dimension than three, so this works only for for n equals three. The idea of taking a number here times some determinant of what's left over and going down the first column that will work, and we'll get to that later this week, one day or another. Is 
tell you a last resort method? Well, I'll talk about it. So this is actually, if you're going to have computers doing it, this is actually the way they're going to do it in general. They're going to try to do pivoting and do operations with rows and columns. Okay, so I'm going to erase my Mathematica message. So, you will recall that doing row operations back in chapter 4, or column operations that we're doing now, has to do with multiplying by these things we called elementary matrices. So recall, we had elementary matrices. that corresponded basically to taking the identity matrix and doing one row operation to it, where you either multiplied one entry by a constant, or you switched two rows, or you added a multiple of one row to another. So we had elementary matrices of the following types, where you had all ones, and then you switched those. And we had elementary matrices that were all ones down the diagonal, but you put a C in one of the places, and then you had one where you did all ones and then you stuck a C somewhere in the I, J spot, say. And when we were doing row operations, we said that multiplying one of these elementary matrices times A did the corresponding row operation. Does everybody remember this? Well, anybody have a wild, wild guess what you're going to do to do column operations? E transform. A times E. Then you're going to put the E on the other side. If you do A times E, then it's going to do the corresponding column. Believe that? You want me to discuss it or should we just move on? Will it be important? It is important. Will it? But remember when you multiply a matrix times this column, instead of getting the i, the one in the i slot, it's now in the j slot. So when you multiply a times this column, you get the j column of a because you're multiplying by the j standard basis vector. And then you do here, you get the i column of A, because you're multiplying by the i standard basis vector. So you switch the two columns of A. This one clearly multiplies the i column. This is in the i slot. And similarly here, when you multiply by this column, you're going to get 1 times the j column of A plus c times the i column of A. So it's doing what it's supposed to be. Okay, well, it won't surprise you then to think about what the determinant when you do one of these elementary operations is. If you do one of these operations, what does that do to the determinant of A? Nothing. No. Be careful. Well, for the first one, it'll become. For the first one, you switch two sign. columns. It might switch the sign. This switches the sign. What did this one do? Multiplied by C. Oh, Multiplied okay. by C. What did this one do? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. So notice that in all cases, this formula is holding. Why is the determinant of this matrix negative 1? You can flip those by a standard matrix, or by one step diagonal. Mm -hmm. So it differs by one switch of columns from the identity. So with the switching the columns gives you a minus sign in the determinant. This one, you pull out the C from the i column, and that multiplies the determinant by C. This one, you add a multiple of one column to another, doesn't change the determinant. The determinant of this is 1, because you can add 
a multiple of this to kill off the C here, and then you'll have the identity. Mm. So this holds for every elementary matrix. Multiplying by the elementary matrix and transforming A just multiplies determinant as if there were a product rule. So because E is typically a composition of several elementary matrices, you, we would just, if we wanted to be rigorous, we'd get a sort of inductive argument. Well, I'm about to say what you just said. Oh. So therefore, if I do a sequence of row operations, if you want to be hyper pedantic as, as Daniel suggested, you could do induction with this formula. But I'm just going to say that you just apply this formula repeatedly and you get a product of determinants of elementary matrices. Agreed? Does that hold for non-elementary matrices? Patience. <laughs> now, <laughs> so, the question now is, what matrices can I achieve as a product of elementary matrices? And all invertible matrices. Do you guys remember this from last semester? Kind of. Recall any non-singular matrix can be written as a product of elementary matrices. Can you mean sort of use a symmetry? Like, because A is any matrix? No. Okay. I'm not quite sure where you're headed. Uh, hang on. All right. So any non-singular matrix can be written in this way. What about a singular matrix? Can it be written in that way? It can't be written this way, right? Because we this is always non-singular. Now, how did we prove this last semester? How did we say any non-singular matrix can be written this way? Would it, how did we see that that was true? It's That's true. So add all those other major base vectors would be the first. We compose that like super matrix. Yeah, that is the problem. Okay, so when we right, we did the super augmented matrix and reduced this to oh, yeah. call it B, I think. So when we reduced this to reduced echelon form here, we argued that that was achieved by multiplying on the left by a sequence of elementary matrices. And so that meant that those elementary matrices turned A into the identity. And so therefore you could get A back by doing the inverse of that process. Okay. All right, so now, does it follow? So you, you guys have been anticipating this ahead of me, of course. If B is the product of elementary matrices, What's the determinant of A, B? Well, that's what we just said. Yes. Yeah. Well, not quite. It's, oh, it's the equation just to your left. Yeah, it's that. All right. But weren't you wanting to say something more than this? So why is this determinant of B? Well, because if those are all elementary matrices, then it's just you know the determinant of E1 times the determinant of E2. I mean, you're sort of multiplying by elementary matrices. Yeah, induction. So it should change the same. So if you can, you can compute determinant of B by thinking of applying this formula repeatedly to this, right? Mm -hmm. Just adding another E each time and using that rule. So this is going to be the determinant of B. So when B is a product of elementary matrices, i.e. when B is non-singular, abracadabra, 
the determinant of AB is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Is that also the determinant of B A? I don't think so. I think so. Well, this formula is commutative, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, but not yeah. AB isn't commutative. That's right, but still Ken's but, right. Yes, that's commutative. The determinant is blind on the order of multiplication because determinant of real numbers, determinant of A is a real number, determinant of B is a real number, and multiplication of real numbers is commutative. But we don't have any rules saying that the determinant of BA is that, do we? Well, or is that what you're saying? All right, well, hang on. So let me, let me, get, to the, let me get to the last step. So here's a theorem. I'll call it a proposition. For any, any n by n matrices A and B, the determinant of A B is the determinant of A. So there, I like to call that the product rule, but be careful, it's not the calculus product rule. So we have proved this in the case where B is non-singular. What if B is singular? Then the determinant is zero. Why? Because then you can row reduce to get a column of, or you can column reduce to get a column of zeros. So, okay. In analogy to real operations. Well, okay. So if B is singular, then you want to claim that the determinant of B is zero. And you're ju Daniel's justifying it by saying... Well, when we had a singular matrix beforehand, we could just... That meant that we could get a row of zeros. By doing a combination of the, ro the by rows. By doing a combination of... Didn't we say last semester that singular matrices are also not invertible? We did. So a matrix that's not invertible is a matrix whose determinant is zero. No, we don't know that. Uh, that's where we're headed now. Uh, okay. That's where, right? You wanted to use that last semester, and I wouldn't let you. The range is the number of digits, so, so therefore. So do you recall that B singular means the rank of B? And rank is, is the dimension of the column space as well as being the dimension of the row space. So, therefore, there is a linear dependence among the columns. So you can combine the columns to get zero in, in some non-stupid way. So that argues that the determinant is zero. Do you agree with that? Some non-trivial <coughs> linear combination of the columns gives zero. And that is going to imply from what we were doing earlier today that the determinant is zero. All right, so B is singular, get B is zero. But why does this formula hold? Because of the singular matrix and the non-singular matrix and the non-singular matrix, right? Rewind. Singular. Wait, a si non-singular to the singular is a singular, right? Okay, that's not what you said a second ago. Oh, I meant, sorry. So B singular implies AB likewise singular, regardless of what A is. Give me a one-line proof of that from last semester. Yeah, equals zero. That's a non-trivial solution. A, B, X equals zero. Good man. There is some non-zero X so that B, X is zero. Therefore, A, B, X, which is A times B, X, is likewise zero. We have a non-trivial solution that makes the matrix singular. So finally, if B is singular, this is zero, but so is this, so the product rule still holds. Agreed? All right. So, now let's see if we can resurrect what you guys were trying to do a few minutes ago. Can we 
now deduce that the determinant of AB is equal to the determinant of BA? If B is singular, it doesn't matter. Yeah, B is singular. So B is non singular. It doesn't matter. Can we just use that? What? If it's determinant AB equals determinant A equals determinant B, which equals determinant BA. Yeah, which is determinant. Yeah, okay. They're both equal to the same thing, so they're equal. Right. Since yeah. determinant of AB equals the product of determinant A, determinant B, but that's commutative. Multiplication real numbers is commutative. So that's the same as determinant B, determinant A. And now that we know this holds for all A and B, independent of singularity, non-singularity, it's true. Well, but that's very convenient that you guys made that observation. As a corollary, we now get the following proposition. Determinant of A is the same as the determinant of A transpose. Is this a homework? This is relevant for your homework, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, to five. But beyond being relevant for your homework, it's also now telling you that basically you can transpose everything in your head and columns turn into rows, and so column operations turn into row operations, and you don't have to learn how to do column operations and go back to doing row operations, right? <laughs> right? How do we prove this? We need a B to transpose an A. Or you can reverse the order of the elementary matrices. You're on the right track, Mr. Jackson. Yeah, what, if, what if your E was one to like transpose it? So note, for any elementary matrix, E, what's true about the determinant of E and the determinant of E transpose? Well, of course, I better be claiming they're equal, but why is that true? This is a question about just the yeah. um, matrices. What distinguishes, I mean, I we always learned about elementary matrices in terms of like matrix A, I guess, when we were doing our operations. So what, how can you look at a matrix and know that it is an elementary one? Okay, never mind. So like a one step one? Yeah. Okay. Well, we know that that's true because E is a matrix. And that, that holds for any matrix. No, 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 no. I want to prove the proposition. Oh. So this is my first step to proving this. Well look at the elementary matrices. Well, the, the middle one's symmetric, so no. The middle one's symmetric, no worry. The first so one. The first one. one. The first one Flip on bin it's symmetric, then you flip on back. So that's sort of. Well, if you switch the rows in the first one or switch the columns, you're still going to get like the same looking. The same. Yeah, the first one is symmetric also, right? And then the third one has the same determinant as. Okay. And the third one isn't symmetric, but you get a, a, a matrix of the exact same form that also has determinant one. So we know this is true by inspection. All right, now, Jackson, what do you want me to do? Um, I know I haven't thought through it exactly yet, but I, I have a guess. Mm -hmm. um, it would be something like your A times your series of E's. You're on the right track. Reverse order, um, and all those E's are the transposes. Okay, you didn't quite say it right, but you're on the right track. So first. But, but you, you, you made a supposition, let me get rid of the case you didn't do. First, suppose A is singular. Right. What happens in the singular case? This is zero. The determinant is zero, but why is the term of the transpose zero? Because, because the, the transpose is zero. Because rank is, some, is true independent of transposing, right? The rank of the transpose equals the rank. So then rank of A transpose equals the rank of A is less than M implies A transpose singular. 
So both of these numbers are zero. I think zero equals zero. Everyone okay with that? Okay. Now, let's, this is what Jackson is off to doing. Suppose A is non-singular. Then he said we can write A times some product of elementary matrices, again, is going to give you the identity. You can do that on the left, you can do it on the right, it doesn't matter. So what does that mean? It means that the transpose of that Remember Shusoff? Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> well, but what do we know about the determinant of a bunch of things multiplied? It's the product, right? So this tells me that the determinant here of all the transposes of all the elementary matrices times the determinant of A transpose. Now what do we know about all the elementary guys? What did we just say? So this is the determinant of the E's times the determinant of A transpose. What do we know about the determinant of the E's? Well, them times the determinant of A is 1. <coughs> so it looks like I have this number times two different numbers equals 1. Therefore, the two different numbers are, in fact, the same. Okay. So that means you can, at this point, put your row operate, put your elementary matrices on either side. So if you want to do row operations, go for it. It's all the same. Suppose A is non-singular. What can you tell me about A? Rank of A is less than N. Mm -hmm. No, it is A. It is a non-singular. Non oh, I thought you said equals N. Sorry. I didn't say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's on video, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Roll tape. <laughs> Suppose A is non-singular, then A is invertible. Said that earlier. So what do we now know? You guys finally wanted us to say this. We've now argued that we've now proved that A is invertible if and only if the determinant isn't zero. We finally now know that in any dimension. Right? Because we've argued up there for non-singular is equivalent to invertible, non-singular is equivalent to determinant not zero. Why are we going this way? But what would like the determinant of A and A inverse? That was where I was headed. Yeah. So that so Lama is asking exactly the question I wanted. What is the determinant is A, if A is invertible, is A inverse invertible? Yeah. Yes. He multiplied by A. 
Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, well, A is the inverse of A inverse. Right. A is the inverse of A inverse. All right. So A inverse is invertible, so the term isn't zero. But now, Davis is asking, do you have a formula for determining A inverse? Yes. Yes. What is it? No. One over one over determinant of A. Because you can use your our rule and we know A inverse times A is right. Yeah. So you have A times A inverse is the identity. So Haley, you should be recognizing this from something you've just learned in your algebra class. That product formula <laughs> is telling you the determinant is a homomorphism of appropriate things. So determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. So determinant of A inverse is the multiplicative inverse of the determinant of A. Now, for reasons that will become much clearer later in the course, if P is any invertible matrix, What can you say about the determinant of P inverse times A times P? It's the determinant of A. Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, there are various ways you can get this. Well, so the it's the to the determinant of A inverse times P times A. Is it just going to be the determinant of A? Yeah, because if they're the multiplicative inverse, they're going to cancel one for the determinant. Of Even the though the matrices don't commute. So by the product rule, you have that. And those are. Commute. And these cancel, right? Yeah. By what we just said. Or. You could be slick going back to what we were talking about earlier and say, even though matrices don't commute, I can commute them inside determinant. You could say determinant of P inverse AP is the same as determinant of P inverse PA. Or maybe I should do it a different way, but let me do it this way. Let me write it AP here times P inverse. That's easier. Fair enough? Just switching those two? Now, why would anyone care about P inverse AP? Isn't that the thing we do, like the LTR, LDL transpose? That was LDL transpose. So you, this, you, you have not seen this here, although, again, oh, Haley has seen I, lots of it in you algebra can class. It, you can raise it to powers really easily? You can. I've, yeah, I've seen that. You've seen that in graph theory? Uh, no, I haven't seen that. Oh, common torques? I just saw it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where you'll see it in this class, what's going on We'll see in chapter 9, it's related to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But what's going on is this is called a change of basis formula. So when you, and I'm going to instruct Haley to think about how this ties in with what she's learning in algebra. When you talk about a linear map, we talked about writing its matrix with respect to the standard basis. But you might ask, what does it look like working in a different coordinate system or with respect to a different basis? And that's the formula. P is going to tell you which basis you want to work in instead. So if P is what's called the change of basis matrix, then P inverse and A is the standard matrix. then P inverse AP will represent the, the linear map in the new basis that you've changed to with this.
So we're going to do a whole, the last month of the course, we'll be talking about this stuff. But what is this telling us? It's telling us that the determinant doesn't change when you change coordinate systems. In other words, the determinant makes sense for linear maps, independent of coordinate system used to look at them. In. That's actually super important. So the consequence is the determinant of a linear map makes sense. When you have a linear map from Rn to Rn, as opposed to just a matrix. Is it snowing yet? It's blinding. It's blinding. It's blinding. Uh, there's, a, there's actually a website called isitsnowinathens.com. No. Click on it, it just says no. <laughs> Great. All right, so in the event that school is canceled tomorrow, I'm going to take five minutes to give you a, the next little bit. No, it's not. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Seriously, what are the odds? No. Mm -hmm. There should be one, one point seven inches of snow tonight. There will be. I'll pull so, out chances. were the chances better today or yesterday? No, no, no. Or today? Today. 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 It's going to be tonight's going to be the most of it at like five tonight, going on into the night, and there should be over an inch of snow. Which means we won't have school tomorrow. Oh, yeah, so we don't really care about the snow, we just want the ice. Sir? You could record <laughs> yourself. <laughs> That's true. It's like, just like, like the camera with you. Yeah. 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 It starts tonight at 5. I'm just not going to worry. That would be awesome. Tomorrow. All right. <laughs> so, Cisco. I mentioned at the beginning <laughs> that you were remembering that we had a, had a different way of computing 3 by 3 Determinants, and in fact, that does generalize to n by n. So we had that if you had a two by two, we had this, of course, was our starting formula for the determinant. And for three by three, we had this thing which is a pain to write out. But remember, we took the first column and we said, take the first entry times the determinant of the two by two thing you get when you remove the first row. Is it a little bit like what we do with the cross multiplying? It's exactly how we do cross products. Okay. Cross products. Using this. Okay. Yeah. And then remember, you have to put in the minus sign. That was important and yet something you all wanted to forget. And then you cross out the second row and you get this. And then you cross out the third row. And notice this is fitting the same pattern. If you take the first column and you cross out the first row, you take A times D. Yeah. Minus B times what you get when you cross out the second, so you have C. You just keep all the... Is the determinant of the one by one matrix D? Yeah. D? Yes. Okay. So yeah, so inductively, if you're thinking about this recursively, you have to start off with the determinant of a one by one matrix, and that's just a, it does not mean that's the value sign that it's determined. So you can sort of see if you're a computer science type that there's a recursive definition here where you want to think about, oh, if I know how to do five by fives, I would be able to do a six by six. So here's how you would sort of recursively it, you would say, if I take a matrix A, I can form a smaller matrix, an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix, by crossing out the ith row and crossing out the jth column. And I'll call that A sub ij. So this is bad notation if you're used to this meaning the entry. I've never used a capital letter for an entry. I've always used little letters. So this just means is the <coughs> matrix obtained by deleting the 
ninth row and jth column of A. So you literally cross them out. You have a smaller size matrix, and you can define what I'm going to call the IJ cofactor of A, C sub IJ, to be a funny minus sign, which we'll understand more next class, minus 1 to which row and which column you're in summed together, times the determinant of this crisscrossed matrix that's one size smaller. Do you see that that's what we're doing here? This is the cofactor of the 1, 1 position. Yeah. What's the cofactor of the 2, 1 position? Well, that's the one. What's 2 plus 1? What's minus 1 to the 3? So the minus sign becomes part of this, right? The minus together with that becomes the cofactor. And then when you're back to the 3-1, to the it's minus 1 to the 4th, which is a plus again. And so the theorem is going to be that you can pick any column or any row your little heart desires and you can take the elements of your, let's say, <coughs> so I'm going to fix the ith row here and go across the ith row and take the entries in the ith row. If I multiply the entries times their cofactors and add them up, I'll get the determinant. And the same thing holds if I go along the jth column and do the same thing. So you can pick any row or any column and use that number, the elements all across that row or across that column, times their cofactors, add them up to get the determinant. <coughs> so I'll leave you with the following thought, especially the computer science types in the room. Suppose you wanted to compute a 6 by 6. And you want to do the determinant. What are you going to have to do to do it this way? So how many 5 by 5s do you have to do? 6. So you have to do 6 5 by 5 <coughs> determinants plus multiplications plus times 5 and additions. Now computer science people typically when they count operations don't count additions because they're they're quick, but multiplications take more operating time. Don't ask me to explain that. Somebody in the room probably can, but I can't. But that's standard when you're counting the efficiencies of algorithms, that you count multiplications, but you don't count additions. Well, how are you going to do the 5 by 5s? 5 by 4 over 5 by 4. We're going to have to a lot. So it's like a factorial determinant. So we're going to end up with basically 6 factorial plus. You're going to end up with more than 6 factorial multiplications you have to do. And each determinant, you're going to work your way down to a 2 by 2, basically, where you have to do 2 multiplications. So this is not very efficient if you have a big matrix. If you do row operations or column operations, you're comparing n factorial with using what these things are called cofactors. And it's actually more than n factorial. You're comparing it to something that's on the order of one third of n cubed using row or column operations. And that's an, that's an interesting exercise actually to do this count and see, see where it comes from. But it doesn't, there's a table in the book that you can look and see about comparing these numbers for various ends. And once you're past n equals 3, this starts to get pretty horrible by comparison. Okay, uh, unless the weather gets absolutely horrendous, I will plan to be in office hours today.